Hello and welcome to Healing Within 23. Uh, lovely to have uh, the opportunity to bring more information to you. And upcoming shows, we hope to have somebody to talk about um, 5G energy. So that should be something. Uh, no, oh, hello, Natasha. It's uh, it's lovely to have you on board. Um, hope you can join us for the rest of the show. And uh, maybe you've got questions that you would like to ask and have answered as well. Um, we will have some upcoming guests in a few weeks. Uh, actually, next week is on standby. We don't really know whether somebody is going to drop in or not. They haven't made up their mind. Um, I can't say it's because of my pretty face, so we'll just say that they're undecided. Tonight we are going to be discussing... Uh, hi, Jess. How are you? Lovely to have you on board. Tonight we're going to be discussing... Uh, grief and loss. Now, this is something which affects all of us. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of people don't want to know about uh, grief and loss. It's the part that hits them the hardest. Uh, yeah, health and love, that's, uh, that's definitely the areas that we love to, to work from. But um, in, in the essence of grief and loss, it's about how we heal ourselves uh, so that we can get past some of those things. And we always associate grief and loss with, yeah, probably Natasha, uh, we always seem to associate grief and loss with death and dying. And that is a major aspect of grief. Uh, but when you, when you think about it, Ah, yeah, my apologies for uh, probably hitting a nerve there, Jess. But uh, it's we'll probably get to that a little bit later. I lost uh, my dad to uh, cancer and my mum to an aneurysm, so that is one of the areas I'll probably be hitting tonight. But we, we seem to head in that simple direction of that, but we need to look at it from another angle, uh, which to me is we lose things uh, on a daily, 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 daily and daily basis. So perhaps somebody loses their job. Now that is a loss. So they go through the same five steps of grieving over the loss of their job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was crying buckets too when mine, my parents passed away, Jess. Um, I, I have lost my job a few times and I must admit that I went through uh, some of the aspects and what I'm going to do is put up the aspects for you. But before I do that, just going to run through the, um, the aspects we really need to have is please share with friends and family. Um, so that we can make this program a lot better. Uh, we can hit a broader atmosphere, we hit more people, we can bring more information to more people and help everybody to heal themselves. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, and the, the, the other one that I would like to bring up is please, if you're interested in the topics uh, that we bring to you, please type heal into the comments and hopefully the little uh, bot will chase you up either today or tomorrow uh, looking for information we're, we're trying to broaden this as far as we can and if you have comments that you would like to make on tonight's show as we go along please ask questions make comments everybody suffers from one form of loss or another so we can say that this is a generous aspect that we all go through uh, at some point in our lives now i have lost my job a couple of times and i have to admit that uh, i went through some of the stages of grief and we tend to um we tend to ignore them i mean the first one we're going to go through is the, the classic the denial and that's generally the first aspect that we go through 
Uh, we we haven't uh, we haven't lost the job. Um, we, we try to be quiet. We try not to influence anybody else in the family. We really don't want to tell them we're in denial from the point uh, of that aspect. And then once we get through that, generally we will go into the anger stage. And you realise that you, you can't deny it any longer. So we're angry either at ourselves or at the situation that we're going through. Um, and then we go through a third stage, which is, you know, bargaining. This is probably, <laughs> we do a lot of that and we bargain with ourselves. Um, you know, if, if I did this better, this wouldn't happen. If I did that better, um, the outcome would have been different. All of these we do, whether, we're, whether this is um, death, dying or any other form, if, if it's a loss, I'm going to go into another area shortly and then we go into depression. I'm so sad, why bother with anything? We put ourselves so low that it's very difficult sometimes for us to get out of it. Uh, Mary has put up a comment, oh, sorry, Mary Ann, uh, grief from loss of both parents, my mum in 1985, 34 years ago, and still holding grief, lost miscarriages, etc. And both of those are terrible aspects to have to use. And I would presume that you have been through most of these steps yourself, uh, Marianne. Uh, the fifth one is the acceptance stage in that it's going to be okay. I can't fight it. I may as well prepare for it or I may as well, um, I may as well become uh cognizant of what's happened and I can't change the outcome. I have to learn to live with what's happening. Now, I don't want to make fun of people who have lost uh, parents or loved ones or miscarriages, um, but I, really, I was hoping to start with the lesser aspects that we really don't take a lot of notice of. Um, and... A person, for instance, a woman may have uh, a mastectomy and she will lose either the breast or part of the breast. And that too is a loss. And the same emotions go through that that we would at any other loss. Um, if we lose um, a finger or a hand or a leg, these are losses we can learn to live with but we still go through the same process of the denial, the acceptance. We might drop off one of the, the stages, but we will generally go through all of them at some point. If, if not immediately, then we will go through them later. We may store up this loss, this grief from a loss of work, uh, a loss of a child, mastectomy, there you go, breast cancer. Speaking of breast cancer, I'm going to use Olivia Newton-John as a reference here. Um, I don't know her and I have no permission to use what she has done. But I, I saw the 60 minutes uh, of what she goes through and the first time that she went through the cancer situation, she went through the five stages. And for some reason, they've now expanded that to seven stages. I'm not sure why. Uh, originally, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had uh, books out on death and dying and grief and loss. And there were five aspects that I put up on the, um, on the screen there. And since then, they have come to the point of um, saying that they have they think that they've shortchanged some of the people and there should be seven steps. Um, honestly, I think the five were there and that's that's pretty much how it started. And if you want to add a couple in, then you haven't changed anything. You've just added to the, the uh, increase in the, in the loss. Um Olivia went through the first one and I'm pretty sure that she went through the whole gamut of emotions. Um, my mum died of breast cancer, 85, no mammograms then. 
uh, when first I know three years earlier, yes, five aspects I'm aware of with grief. Yes, um, we make fun of it and we try to avoid the topic as much as possible because it, it involves uh, mainly the heavy aspects of somebody passing. And to be truthful, sometimes I think that if we lose an animal, we grieve far more for the animal than we do for people who are close to us. Um, when my mother and father passed, it was a long period, so we saw it coming and uh, we went through probably a couple of the stages early, uh, probably the denial aspect and uh, possibly the anger aspect we went through early. But when the time came for um, recognition that it, it was an eventuality we had to face, uh, we got through it and we came to the acceptance stage. And although the grief was there and the memories were there and all that afterwards, we I relied on the memories uh, to make the passage so much easier. But uh, over a period of time of maybe six months or more, there were things that came up and I had to deal with those things again and again until eventually uh, I came to a point where the acceptance was wholehearted. But it's been um, probably 12 months, close on 12 months now since we lost our last dog. And honestly, um, there are times when it still hits me because she went very quickly and I was not prepared for the, uh, the loss of that contact. And I think uh, the reaction was probably more involved for the pet than what it had been for my parents because I had seen their demise and what they were going through coming. So that was an aspect that uh, I was able to go through the early steps, uh, probably before their passing. Whereas when something happens quickly, whether it's family, whether it's um, friends, whether it's an animal, if it happens quickly, it tends to grab us and we store information, we store energy, we store anger, we store... Um, sometimes we bring up the bad stuff in the memories to, in the hopes of remembering them more, but it doesn't help. It just causes the, the memories to linger longer and the clarity to leave and we hold the grief so much longer. But um, we, we really associate the grief that comes with um, death and dying. But grief and loss can be about anything, absolutely anything. For children, it can be uh, the loss of a friend because they've got to move to a new school. Um, sometimes people have to change countries for their job. And a child or a person can go through grief and loss for that transition. So the aspect of grief and loss is not restricted to the more heinous side of grief and loss, which is death and dying. Um, and sometimes we forget that our children can suffer quietly because we're trying to be very strong uh, and our children see us as not showing those emotions of explaining why we're angry or why we're in denial or why we are going through what we're going through. And our children begin to grow up with the aspect that we must remain closed off when it comes to grief and loss. And I would encourage anybody that is going through grief and loss and has children to try and involve the children in the in what they're going through so that the children understand that you may be quiet, but you're quiet because you're thinking about the loss. Uh, whatever that loss might be, if, if it's a loss of a job or changing of a country or something like that, involve your children and involve your partner. 
it's very difficult to hold a lot of this stuff in. It doesn't do us any good at all. We just store it up, and at some point we have to release it. And if we don't release it, it will come back and bite us again and again and again. Now, there's a lot of counsellors out there and there is a lot of people who will tell you that they, uh, they deal with these problems and how to handle them. If you need to visit these people, then I suggest that you do so wholeheartedly. Um, but understand that if you know what the five stages of grief are, and you're willing to look at what's going on in your mind and what you're saying to your friends and family, then uh, the chances are that you will recognise it and um, you will be able to get through and see that what stage you're in. Let's have a look. Sorry, Marianne, I hadn't. I didn't roll the uh, thing. That I'm going through the grief with my son moving out of home. I miss him. His company and chats, uh, but no, it's another stage of my life. I'm trying to embrace the situation, and that's brilliant, Marianne, that you are doing that. And just by the sheer comments that you've stated, you've already probably gone through a couple of the stages of um, grief and loss. Uh, the five stages there we all especially when our children are moving out we have that loss it's, it's suddenly there's a hole we walk into a room and there's no one there um, sometimes through uh, misadventure or misfortune um, sometimes it could be a breakup with our child with somebody else that they come back home again and then there's that rebirth of connection and if they move out again then there's loss again and every time that uh, this goes on in our lives it, it probably doesn't get as bad the second time or um, if it happens more than once but we still go through the same aspects of uh, denial uh, why has my child moved out um, the anger stage, if I had been uh, more communicative or something like that, they might have stayed a little bit longer. Um, there, are, there are always aspects of our lives that we, we look into. And sometimes we might start bargaining with our kids, even if it's for them to move out. Um, this also is a form of bargaining uh, in that if your, your son or your daughter is getting older, you want a bit of peace and quiet time. So we try to bargain with them. You know, go with somebody else for a little bit and then trial it and come back so that we don't have that sudden loss in our lives. And and when they move out, we can sometimes go into that depressive state of I'm so sad. Um, why bother going to work? Why bother doing this? Why bother doing that? when um, in actual fact we're just missing those people because they have moved on to a new part of their life and we need to move on to a new part of ours. Now, I'm not trying to make light of people who have lost children or any of those aspects of people who have lost fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews, whatever. Um, these are very sad things and we take time to go through them and depending on how close the person was to us depends on how we relate to the five stages of grief and loss uh, many of the many of the people that i know that uh, have gone through that sometimes blame other people for the loss and if you've lost a child, um, sometimes without thinking about it, we can say things that will make you feel inadequate. Um, I think some of the worst things that you can say to somebody 
that's going through the grief of that is or you have another child or you can have another child this just reinforces on that person that they've already lost something and their grief is suddenly increased so if you happen to come across a situation where somebody has lost a child and you're aware of it then you've really got to be cautious about how you respond to that person <clears throat> um, is there a good thing to say i'm honestly not sure but you know mentioning other children is probably not the situation you want to mention uh, when they're going through such a thing as uh, the loss of child or stillbirth or something along that fashion. Um, I'm happy to see that one person here, and we've had one comment so far, and a few comments have been put up there. Um, many of the things that we inadvertently say later in our conversations with people we sometimes leave them on their own because we don't know how to respond to their loss or their grief and we say things maybe six months down the line when they may still be going through the grief process and we think that they are so much better and they are putting on that lovely face that says, oh, I'm fine, I'm feeling really good now, I've got over it and I'm, I'm dealing with everything and I'm really good. And sometimes we will say something um, about the past loved one or the past animal or about the children leaving home and we will not be aware that we have simply brought to the surface uh, images or um feelings that this person hasn't dealt with so even six months 12 months down the line uh, we can still have those aspects of our life from, from the grief or the loss coming through and one of the things that um, i found most interesting was my father had been gone for probably two or three years and i passed a gentleman in the street who wore Californian poppy aftershave and hairdressing um, cream. And the smell of the, the poppy, Californian poppy, just wafted up my nose. And all of a sudden, I had memories floating in, in the back of my head about my father. Um, and the rabbiting trips that we took and just little things that came up and it's amazing how a smell or um, even a color can bring back some of those memories and we need to deal with that grief again it's something that we hadn't dealt with so we anticipate that um, oh it's all going to be over very quickly I've, I've been to the funeral i've grieved for my parents i've done this and i've done that and um, it's all over and done with now. Well, truthfully, it's not. It, it could be five years down the track and something will set you off. I've had occasion where I've seen a woman walking down the street and from the back I would have sworn it was my mother. And that knowing that she has already passed, it's like just a friendly reminder that, you know, somebody is watching out for me and that, yes, uh, she might be gone, but she's still in the memories. And I figure that um, the best thing that we can say to ourselves is when something like that happens, but we're being contacted and, and giving a boost to say we're on the right path, we're dealing with it, and they're watching out for us. Now, I'm just going to go back over these five, um, five steps. Now, the first one is generally denial. Now, that doesn't always mean to say that the first one will be denial. But in most cases, we begin to deny um, aspects of what we're going through in that um, we deny that we had any activity or any closeness to 
what the person was going through, um, what they felt. And sometimes we will have grief and loss of the fact that we didn't do anything for that person. Sometimes we might have seen it coming and... Yeah, a, a song too is sufficient. Sometimes it can be a, a song that you um, you regularly played with your parents or with that friend as they went through, um, and it will bring back those memories again. If it if it feels if it feels harsh, then you haven't dealt with it. If it's like um, oh, that reminds me of so and so then you may well have dealt with it and what you're getting is just um, a memory coming through to say, you know, this person was in my life, I appreciated them and I still appreciate the fact that they did a lot for me. Excuse me while I drink. Um, we'll go on to the second stage and... I know that people really don't want to talk about grief and loss, but it is an aspect of our lives that we need to look at very closely because it, it happens to us all. Now, the second one is when the individual recognises that denial can't continue. We go through that stage of denying that anything happened, I could have done anything, I could have done something better, uh, we go through that stage and then we go into anger mostly at ourselves and we start abusing ourselves. You stupid person, if you'd have done this, if you'd have done that, if you'd have spent more time, if you had done blah, 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 um, or perhaps it's the fact that you have a cancer or something like that, and you'll get angry with yourself in, in saying that if I had changed my life earlier, it would have this would not have happened and you're an idiot for not doing this sooner. Well, in truth, there's no way of knowing whether that would have actually eventuated. Had you have changed your diet, had you have changed doing this at work, would it have changed anything? You really don't know. Um, you just become, I think, more aware and more caring in what you do after you've been through that experience. So uh, children who lose their grandparents when they're young experience uh, a sense of loss and grief, especially if they're close to that grandparent. But they learn very early on that death is a part of life and hurt is part of life. And it's how we discuss these things with the children when it happens that makes the difference. And sometimes the children will get angry because they think they're the ones that cause what happened. They may have had a slight argument or something with the grandparent and that grandparent has passed away a little bit later. And they won't realize what's happening and they may blame themselves for it. Now, this one is probably a little bit harder to anal analyse as an individual, but we do start bargaining with ourselves. Now, to take it from the point of view of, say, a job or something like that, again, we come back to this aspect of, you no, know, um, had I have done something different, would the outcome have been totally different? Um, if I'd been uh, less boisterous with the boss, would I have kept my job? Um, these are aspects that we look at and we try to generate ideas as to whether we are at fault. And depending on the situation, you may have been very outspoken with management at work about uh, an issue which you consider dangerous for other people. But in doing so, you put yourself on a short list and the, they have not so much um, put you on a list to be made redundant, but you, they watch you a little bit more closely and you begin to feel that they are trying to find errors with you so that they don't have to put up with your 
aspects of of the bargaining um, and in uh, in trying to see a way out of the grief of what you've been through you may very well end up going into another aspect of the um, of the the grief and loss which is depression uh, you'll get yourself so enamored with where you're your, where you're going and what you're doing that you'll get in a, into a depressed state about I don't know whether I've done the right thing I don't know whether this is how I should be talking I don't know whether that's something I should have done and then that drags you into a very low aspect and it's tough to get out of that aspect and if it's related to um, a greater loss such as uh, an animal or a person then that depression is it can be um, debilitating. It can draw you into a long-term funk where you just don't know how to get out of it. Um, everything seems to be clawing at you and you can't seem to find an answer to anything and in doing so, you tend to overlook things that you should be doing and then those things collapse in on you which makes the depression even greater uh, there is no finite answer for how long um, something like this can last it is an aspect of um, loss that sometimes the depression is only slight but normally when we're talking about the loss of a person or an animal then we go into a funk which is pretty tough to get out of. But if we look at it from the the loss of um, maybe the loss of an organ, um, an intestinal operation, uh, it could be prostate, um, could be anything in the body where something is taken from us. We have a sense of emptiness, a sense that something is not there that should be there. And even though we know what it is and where it is and why it had to be removed, that doesn't remove the loss or the grief from that action. Even if you go in for just day surgery uh, for a minor operation, you will generally come out with a, a sense of not depression but um, a slight funk that you have done something and something has changed and you don't know what exactly but something has changed and then we get to the last aspect uh, according to elizabeth kubler ross which is it's going to be okay i can't fight it i may as well prepare for it now the prepare for it is generally like when we're talking about operations or uh, a passing or something like that we really don't want to prepare for somebody that's passing but we we have to um if we're going in for an operation whether it's an amputation whether it is to remove cancer tumor uh, or something like that we have to come to a point where we say it's going to be okay we have to find a positive aspect and uh, you really you can't fight it you have to go in and it has to happen and fight as you might um, it happens and you've got to go along with it and um, once you reach this stage I think you're on the road to recovery now I know that some of the people here tonight have you know, had miscarriages and that's something that uh, on the on a first occasion is probably very debilitating <coughs> but you you may get to an acceptance stage and you say right we'll try again <coughs> now there suddenly comes an aspect in the early stages <coughs> where uh, mentally uh, the woman may begin to think well this is about the time when we had problems with the last try 
and the very aspect of bringing that to the fore is bringing up that grief and loss again. And we believe that the uh, acceptance has passed, but in truth, we go into a fear stage. Um, probably, uh, I'd say probably close to the bargaining and denial aspect. Uh, sorry, Jesse. That's um, it's. I, I know it's difficult to get through that, and it's always harder, honestly, on the second one. And if there happens to be a third, it takes a great deal of energy um, and emotional stability to try again. Uh, I don't know whether you have. Uh, and I wish you the best if you haven't. But um, there's, there's uh, honestly, I, I, I don't know how to... Um, offer my condolences more than uh, what, what I am. But having said that, I hope that you have managed to go through the steps and have come to a stage of acceptance where you understand that possibly it was their time to experience just that aspect and that you were the uh, the channel for their their start of life all right let's see what we get i actually had crystal healing a few weeks before i felt pregnant with my youngest rainbow baby um did that did that help for you uh jesse um you say it wasn't the right tone yeah Yeah, I'm happy that you acknowledge and love your angel babies now. Um, and I'm glad to see that the acceptance is there and they understand how hard it is for somebody to go through that. Yeah, time is an aspect. Um, for some people, it will vary immensely. For some people, a few weeks is long enough to grieve and experience a loss. But for others... Um, it takes forever and a day uh, for the loss of a, a loved one, uh, somebody you've lived with for 40 years or 50 years. It can be um, a terrible experience. Um, Marianne, uh, generally rainbow babies are babies who have either come into the world and passed very soon after or um, they are children which have not come to full term. Um, <clears throat> we, we talk about rainbow children, but that's a, a different topic. These are children which have found their spirituality early. And in the case of rainbow babies, it means that they came in for us. We believe that they came in for a specific reason They've achieved that reason, which may have been short-term or birth, and then that's all they wanted to experience. Um, unfortunately, it leaves the mother with a great sense of loss. And perhaps, I don't want to be cruel in any way, but perhaps that's part of the learning lesson as well, uh, not just for the child, but also for the um Ah, there's another aspect. Oh, I wasn't aware of that one. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jesse. Um, this is another aspect that I haven't heard used in that particular uh, drain, but um, I will keep that in mind and uh, use that in the future if you don't mind. I was led to believe that a rainbow baby was one that had either just came to term and was lost or had not quite come to term and was lost. Um, I'm happy that you have two children which have uh, been conceived successfully. 
uh, and they have birthed after a loss. I hope that brings you great joy and uh, I hope that they bring every moment of expectation that you expected from the one that you have lost. <clears throat> There you go. I am learning a great deal from you, Jesse. I'm thankful that you have brought this up for other people. If you see this in replay, please um, just let everyone uh, know that these terms are out there. I am not aware of the Sunset and Sunrise Babies. That's a new one to me. I had heard of Shooting Stars, but I wasn't quite sure on what that was related to. Um, I assumed that that was, um, in this case, like twins that had um, come very soon after a loss. But uh, again, I could be wrong with that. <clears throat> Anything I can do to help and spread the love? Well, I honestly, Jesse, I think you have probably hit the heart of a lot of people. And if anybody tunes in uh, at a later point, um, they will be in awe, I think, of you and, and what you've been through and the fact that you have two children and have overcome that uh, aspect of your loss. And have, I hope that you you went through it with a minimum of problems. <coughs> Sometimes we, we don't realise how long it takes for people to uh, acquire acceptance about uh, the loss of a young one especially. Uh, is there anybody out there that can associate a loss that is not uh, to do with a person? Uh, because sometimes we forget uh, that loss comes in all its forms and all its um, conundrums and the problems that it goes through. I will put up uh, for those people that are um, may watch this in replay, I'm going to put that there. This is a couple of sites that are available for people who may uh, already be experiencing um, a loss of some description. Yes, a loss of oneself is another aspect of um, grief and loss. Um, that, that's a very broad aspect and it's not easy to actually find the fundamentals of that one. But we do constantly go through a sense of depression. Um, a lot of people suffer from the depression. <clears throat> now, I have put up there the Friends of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. That's a Facebook page which is very good and a lot of people talk about... Um, grief and loss on that particular channel and there is the Kubler Ross Foundation and if anybody is going through uh, grief and loss you might want to check these out. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross put out a great many books on death and dying, grief and loss, um, how to talk to children about grief and loss. So I, I find uh, I try to encourage people to go down that path. Now I have a sheet here which states that there are seven stages of grief. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll mention the seven uh, in, in the sense that I don't want to um, find people who do counselling today. They now have a seven, uh, the seven series. So I want to mention all the seven that they now have. And the first being guilt. I'm not sure why guilt is considered in there when denial is probably looking at the guilt aspect. But um, they have guilt, denial, shock and disbelief, 
may have uh, anger and bargaining, depression, loneliness and reflection, and reconstruction and working through and then acceptance. Um, to me, acceptance is reconstruction and working through. But in today's um, technology and training, a lot of the things that um, Elizabeth and others have brought to the fore have been extended and made to fit a new world of technology. And that seems to be the latest thing. There's actually now a, um, a concept of loss related to technology in that children, when taken away from uh, computers, tablets, phones, go through the same seven steps of, well, five steps of denial, anger, acceptance, um, all of those, when they are restricted or prevented from having their technology. And this is becoming a new um, emotional aspect that is going through a lot of the psychological and psychology, uh, psychotherapy and all of these aspects are now taking this as being the new dis-ease for children. So when you think about grief and loss and you, we talk about parents, we talk about children, we talk about grandparents, we talk about animals, but we're coming to a stage now where if people don't have their their phones and their iPads, um, then they they go into depression and they go into anger and it's so hard. Um, ADHD and ASD uh, are aspects that uh, sometimes technology can help with, but I believe that in my own self, I, I can't say this from a psychology standpoint, but truly I believe that um, the use of iPads and iPhones to keep your children quiet when they're very, very young, prior to kindergarten or school, is uh, removing from them the aspect of authority. Now, I, I don't want to say that your child doesn't have the authority aspect because they have ADHD and ASD, but there are a lot of children who, when they get to school, have had so much time on tablets uh, and then they're suddenly expected to stop using this tablet or the phone and play, stop playing games uh, and they have to sit and listen to somebody telling them something and all of a sudden the teachers are now having to um, correlate the children to different energies because they become very angry and, and the parents say, oh, well, it's never like that at home and that's... That's because when they get home, their parents are probably very busy. They, they may both be working. Uh, they may not have a great deal of time. They come home from work and they've got to get stuck into the stuff that has to be done, uh, the cleaning, the cooking and all the other stuff that has to be done. And it's just easier for them to stick them in front of a computer or a tablet and say, can you watch this until I finish doing what I'm doing? They're not doing it out of spite or to make their children um, angry at school, but they can't understand the aspects that this technology is something that's going to be taken away from them when they get to school and the child is going to suffer from a loss. And um, I, I guess we don't really promote this either in the health system or in the school system when the when they have parents day and the like we sometimes forget that we've got to mention this to um, the parents that if they spend too much time with the computer they are going to become supremely dependent on the computer 
it's coming to a stage at the moment where people can't even give change in their mind. They have to use a calculator to use uh, a machine or a calculator to figure out change. And when we've got to that stage, we're so dependent upon the technology that when it's taken away from us, we don't know what to do. We suddenly become angry. We suddenly become despondent. We suddenly blame everybody else for what's going on in the world. And uh, these are all different forms of loss and grief that are now becoming more prevalent. Uh, for the older people, we have probably been through uh, most of the stuff we've had to do mentally or physically, and we haven't had the computer or the technology. And we're not so dependent upon it, and which is probably why most of us, uh, as we get older, can't handle the speed at which this form of technology changes. And even that is a form of grief and loss. Uh, we become despondent and we get to the, to the stage where we begin to enter depression and bargaining. Uh, we, we try to get people to do the job for us. Instead of learning how to do something, we want other people to do it for us, which is our bargaining aspect. And we hit, hit depression because we can't handle the amount of change that's going on in our lives. So even this is a form of grief and loss. Um, so everything that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis is in some way a form of grief and loss. And I hope that I have not bored you with too much of this. Um, we always associate grief and loss with death and dying. And both of those subjects are true, but we fail to see that it's the little things that prepare us for the bigger things. So if we can learn to handle the loss and the emotions for the smaller losses, when the big ones come, such as the departing of a family member or a family pet or um, a change of circumstance or a change of location, we can handle them a lot better and we can share them a lot better. Um, one of the big things that most of these people, including Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, mentioned was sharing and if you have somebody that you can confide in and talk with this can help you to go through a lot of the emotions that we've talked about very quickly um, <clears throat> i'm not saying it's going to happen overnight but the availability of somebody who's willing to listen and just listen will allow you to go through your grieving through your depression through your anger through your denial and uh, it will allow you to go through that more solidly more quicker and um speaking about it is brilliant if you're doing it with your partner and if you're talking with your children about it and they're old enough to understand some of me are too young to understand but you sometimes need to make it, um, dumb it down a little bit. I don't like to use that phrase, but for very young children, it's something you have to be cautious about how you, um, you talk to your children about it. Um, I think we have just about come to the end of uh, where I can go with this tonight. We hope to have somebody in next week, but we have not had a confirmation. And so I'm going to leave it a little bit for another couple of days um, before I post what the uh, next person will be bringing on. But I hope that you have managed to find some relief or some comments and some help either on those sites or. Um, on the discussion tonight and i thank you very much for putting your comments in tonight it's been more than welcome and it's given us something to talk about and especially to you jesse for your comments and i appreciate what you put up there 
If you're watching this in replay, please type heal in the comments and hopefully the little uh, bot will catch up with you in the next day or two and we'll try and promote more of this in the future. If you have something that you would like to see discussed on one of the shows, again, please leave it in the comments and we will do our utmost to try and find somebody that can discuss the topic that you're after at some point in the near future. Uh, thank you very much for tonight, and I hope to catch up with you next week, uh, 7.30 p.m. Wednesday evening each week, so tune in for us, and we look forward to having you again next week. This is Roy Fenton from Healing Within, and I look forward to seeing you at uh, next Wednesday for Healing Within 24.